Hurricane Milton may have dodged its worst case scenario, but the warning signs are getting impossible to ignore. One of the fastest intensifying storms ever recorded, Milton's explosive growth is signaling a new reality. With the Gulf of Mexico waters nearing record high temperatures, these monstrous storms are just the beginning. Is the U.S. ready for this new normal? And what's being done to mitigate the effects from the next one? As the eye of Hurricane Milton. Hurricane Milton roared into Florida's west coast after undergoing extreme rapid intensification. This is when a tropical cyclone's maximum sustained winds increase by about 58 miles per hour or more within 24 hours. Hurricane Milton's maximum sustained winds increased by around 92 miles per hour in that time frame. It went from a tropical depression to a monstrous Category 5 hurricane in two days. This happened less than two weeks after Hurricane Helene, which also lashed the state with strong storm surge and ferocious winds. And the ocean temperatures in which Milton intensified were made up to 400 to 800 times more likely by climate change over the two weeks prior. The U.S. greenhouse gas emissions in 2022 totaled 6.3 million metric tons. And it's vital to understand how that contributes significantly to climate change and the increase in hurricane activity. All those emissions are creating a blanket of trapped excess heat around the Earth, and our oceans absorb about 90% of that. This fuels the rapid intensification of major hurricanes. We know that as human beings increase uh, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, largely by burning fossil fuels, we are increasing the temperature all around the planet. In certain places like the Gulf of Mexico, temperatures are actually growing faster than around other places on the planet uh, over the ocean. And that means that there's a lot more fuel available to these storms than there would have been if we hadn't burned greenhouse gases. But at the same time, there have been promising strides in reducing emissions. The U.S. is transitioning towards cleaner energy sources, with renewable energy like wind and solar power growing rapidly. In 2023, for the first time, renewable energy surpassed coal and electricity generation in the U.S. The Inflation Reduction Act, passed in 2022, aims to reduce U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by roughly 40% by 2030. These advancements represent important steps toward prioritizing the climate crisis, but much more is needed to slow that damage, especially when we look at how the intensity of severe weather events are impacting people's everyday lives. Hurricane Helene's rainfall was about 10% heavier due to human-caused climate change. And these storms are not just stronger, they're more frequent. If we look over the historical period, say the last 45, 50 years, we see that billion-dollar disasters in the United States have been dropping from around 60 to 100, every 60 to 100 days 50 years ago, down to every nine days here in 2024. So every nine days, the United States is facing a billion dollar disaster associated with, you know, weather conditions that have been influenced by climate change. But beyond the numbers, what are these storms really costing us? And how are they affecting our communities? From flood ravaged homes to insurers pulling out of high risk markets, these storms are stressing the U.S. economy, and without significant intervention, the real estate market in coastal areas has the threat of becoming unsustainable. Florida's Gulf Coast, home to over 16.2 million people, has been hit hard. Milton tore through many of the same communities as Helene did before they had the time to recover. This rapid succession of disasters, called compound disasters, creates a crisis that insurance companies struggle to manage. I've already seen reports of insurers leaving uh, markets after anticipating the payouts. Unfortunately, we've seen this along the Gulf Coast and in states like Florida. In some cases, it's getting uh, prohibitively expensive or non-existent, and more, or at least more and more difficult to find, uh, as it's just less and less viable to provide insurance in areas exposed to high risk under current models. And it's not just home ownership at stake. The National Flood Insurance Program, which offers flood insurance to property owners, renters, and businesses to help them recover faster after flooding events, has paid out more money than it brought in because of the frequency of these severe weather events. Because of this, they have to keep extending their authorization to borrow money from the U.S. Treasury, which helps manage public debt. The program has seen 31 short-term extensions since 2017 operating on borrowed time with no long-term fix in sight. The U.S. emergency management systems, including federal, state, and private resources, respond to disasters on an event-by-event -event basis. 
But when multiple disasters hit in quick succession, communities like Tampa are left especially vulnerable. For instance, Tampa's stormwater systems were already weakened by debris from Helene, and then Milton overwhelmed them again. On top of this, 41% of households in Tampa have less than $2,000 in savings, and many are in debt. Without the financial means to evacuate or repair homes, residents are pushed deeper into crisis. When housing markets are already tight, as they are in these hurricane-prone regions, repairs and insurance claims can take years. A broken insurance system in the face of more frequent billion-dollar storms is threatening entire industries. From Tampa to the Gulf Coast, these recent storms are revealing those insurance cracks. In the U.S., flood insurance is different from typical home insurance, which covers wind damage from hurricanes, but not flooding. Homeowners have to purchase flood insurance separately if they want their homes protected against flooding. Industry experts say that many homeowners don't even know that their standard home insurance doesn't cover floods. One estimate from the Insurance Information Institute claims that only about 6% of homeowners in the U.S. have flood insurance. Sarasota County in Florida took a direct hit from Hurricane Milton, where only 23% of homeowners have flood insurance. So why the low number for a county that's right on the water? Well, it's largely because of the expense, with Florida's average flood insurance rate sitting around $850 per year, and some areas closer to the coast are soaring over $3,600 per year. And many people don't think that the upfront cost is worth the coverage. There's a gap in awareness around flood insurance and the consequences that can come with not having it. In some parts of the US, the concept of climate change has been outlawed from government and education discussions. Florida has notoriously downplayed climate risks and now finds itself as the target of two back-to-back -back storms. And national insurance companies are biting off more than they can chew by insuring people in these high-risk climate disaster areas. The risks from hurricanes, rising building costs, and ongoing lawsuits are forcing them to retreat. Just last year, insurance giant Farmers Insurance pulled out of Florida, and this dilemma is being echoed across the country. Major insurance companies have also pulled out of parts of California that are prone to wildfires, leaving vulnerable residents paying more than they can afford if their home is destroyed. This growing trend of insurers withdrawing from high-risk areas highlights the urgent need for climate action and adaptation. As companies retreat, residents are left more vulnerable, and states that continue to deny the realities of climate change are falling further behind in protecting their communities. So we're seeing these storms pack more of a punch. We're seeing them uh, with, with greater force. We're seeing higher uh, inundation, coastal flooding, higher amounts of rainfall falling, uh, which is partly why we're seeing such historic flooding in areas that, that don't have a lot of flood insurance, that don't have this historical risk. Flood mitigation, seawalls of, of flood proofing, new building codes, things like that. These are all the steps that we can take to help harden uh, our communities to be a little more resistant to disasters. The Florida Billing Code has been updated twice since 2018 and is among one of the toughest along Gulf and Atlantic Coast states. It's a set of regulations that dictate how a home or commercial building must be constructed to mitigate hurricane damage. Having a building up to code ultimately lowers damage costs and saves lives. Buildings in Florida are required to be constructed to withstand wind speeds of up to 180 miles per hour. However, there are still gaps in these adaptation measures, especially for low-income communities. Milton's landfall in Florida serves as a grueling reminder. Denial won't stop these storms. As the Gulf waters grow warmer, the potential for more Category 4 and 5 hurricanes becomes a reality. And a new layer of hurricane preparedness. Misinformation swirled in the wake of these recent storms. Some sources downplayed Milton's strength, causing many people to delay evacuations. And with lives and property on the line, accurate information has never been more critical. That's why FEMA launched a webpage to respond to rumors and confirm the facts regarding the storms. Yet in a divided America, where even the climate crisis itself is debated, getting everyone on the same page is proving difficult. So what do we do about it? While the U.S. is grappling with record-breaking storms, other countries are making strides in climate adaptation. So can we catch up? One example is looking at Japan, a country particularly vulnerable to natural disasters because of its climate and topography. 
a series of typhoons struck the country between the end of World War II and the late 1950s, killing over a thousand people every year. So after the war and ever since, they've hustled to shore up against these natural disasters and honed in on disaster preparedness. And since 1981, many of Japan's buildings have complied with construction design rules, and they're built to withstand typhoons, tremors, and heavy snow. So when it comes to the United States, climate adaptation is key. And it's not just about policy, it's about funding. At both the state and federal levels, the US is making progress, but many agree that it's not enough. And current funding is merely a fraction of what is actually needed to safeguard communities. The National Institute of Building Sciences reports that every $1 spent on mitigation saves an average of $6 in recovery costs. But as climate disasters multiply, the window to ramp up funding and action is shrinking. Federal initiatives like FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program provide funds to help communities prepare for and mitigate the effects of natural disasters. But the demand outweighs what's available. At the local level, we're seeing Florida's building codes consistently ranked as the safest in the country. Most notably after 1992, when Hurricane Andrew prompted the state to reevaluate the efficiency of their existing codes. Then in 2002, the Florida Building Code was formally adopted. This goes to show that a continued adaptive approach is key, along with the climate. Human beings have unequivocally changed the environment in which hurricanes like Milton, that will do an extreme amount of damage, uh, change the environment in which they've grown, developed, and intensified. But that's not the end of the story. We have the chance to make a better end of the story by working together to reduce the climate impacts across our planet by working together to reduce our climate emissions as a global and local set of communities. One bright side is the nation's increasing focus on the green transition. The passing of that Inflation Reduction Act has been a pivotal moment for climate action, committing billions to clean energy projects and reducing emissions, setting the stage for a more sustainable future. This kind of action needs to accelerate, with every state working to push forward renewable energy projects, electrify transportation, and invest in resilience measures for future generations. The choices the U.S. makes today will have profound impacts on future generations, both in how they are affected by climate change and how they're set up to fight it. Without bolder, more unified action, the country risks falling further behind, leaving communities even more vulnerable to the next round of storms. But with increased state and federal funding, strength in policies, and a commitment to accelerating the green transition, the U.S. can lead the world in climate resilience. It's time for that unified approach, because these storms are not waiting for us to act. Both Hurricanes Milton and Helene are not anomalies. They're warning signs of a future shaped by climate change. So the U.S. must face these storms head-on, with better infrastructure, stronger policies, and a commitment to reducing those impacts of climate change. Because our future depends on it.